Thank you, Brother Ken. If you're physically able this morning, I invite you to kneel with me as we talk to Jesus. Oh God, empty me of me. Fill me, Father, with your Holy Spirit. Fill each person in this place with your Spirit. That as you speak through your perfect Word, that each person here would hear clearly from you and would respond in an affirmative way, by following where you are leading them to go. As John writes in John 3.30, Christ must increase, but I must decrease. This day is not a day about us. It is a day about Jesus. A day, Father, when the difficulties of us can be surrendered at a perfect throne and perfect peace known instead of loneliness, struggle, discord, hate, unforgiveness. Oh God, today, We can know freedom because, as Paul writes, it is for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free. No longer do we have to be held in bondage any longer. But today, God, we can have peace. May it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your copy of God's Word. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to look at verses 3, 4, and 5 this morning. On every American flag that is somewhat contemporary, now I'm not including the earlier revolutionary flags, but on our contemporary American flag, there are three colors. White, stands, which stands for purity and innocence. Red, which stands for hardiness and valor. And also blue indicating vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Additionally, there are 13 stripes, 7 red, 6 white, indicating the 13 original colonies which separated from Britain and declared their independence from Britain and fought for it accordingly. In truth, the American flag stands for freedom. And yet there are those in our culture who choose to burn the flag as a sign of insolence and disagreement with policies in our country. There are even those who fly the American flag upside down as a great sign of disrespect. Some others wear the flag on their ties, their shirts, wristbands. They fly it in yards, hang it from rafters, raise it in the court squares, Salute it at sporting events, but let me ask you this morning, do we truly understand what it means to wear the stripes? Do we understand what it means to wear the stripes? Many years ago, a teacher called a parent about midday, caught the parent off guard, especially when the conversation begins like this, Miss Smith, this is Miss Jones, Mark's teacher. I've been teaching for 40 years and something happened today that has not normally happened. To see, my kids can't get away with that because they'll just go across this hall and tell Miss Ann what happened. But unfortunately, Mark got a call. And his mother hesitatingly asked, well, what happened? And his teacher said, well, I was teaching creative writing today. And in the creative writing session I teach, I always share the story of the ant and the grasshopper. The ant worked hard all summer and stored up food while the grasshopper played. Well, wintertime came, and the ant had plenty of food, but the grasshopper was hungry. And she said, what I do then is I ask the students to each complete the story in their own words. 
She said, some students will answer. Well, the majority of students will answer, well, the ant shared his food with the grasshopper, and they both lived. She said, I've had a few students over the years to write. Well, the ant said to the grasshopper, because you were foolish, Mr. Grasshopper, and did not work, did not store up for yourselves anything, you're not going to get anything. And so the ant lived, and the grasshopper died. But she said, something happened today with your son. He, he first came up to me and asked, teacher, may I draw a picture? And I said, well, all right, you may draw a picture, but you must complete the story. And she said, when I received his paper, I couldn't believe what I saw. Because his answer had been given by no child I've ever had. And it read as follows. The ant worked hard while the grasshopper did not. The ant had plenty while the grasshopper had none. The ant gave the grasshopper all of his food. The ant died and the grasshopper lived. And she said beside his story, he drew three crosses. Do you understand what it means to wear the stripes? And I'm not simply speaking now of the stripes of our own nation. Do you know what it is to wear the stripes of Jesus Christ? If you found your place in the text this morning, it is Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 3. When you found your place, would you stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? Now, before I begin reading, I want to say this. There have been many scholars over time that have suggested this person of whom Isaiah is writing is a suffering servant. Some have said he was Zerubbabel, an Old Testament priest. Others have said he was Joshua. Some have said he was also in the Old Testament, not Joshua from Moses, though a different one. Others have said the suffering servant is someone who's yet to come. But I believe that the suffering servant that Isaiah is speaking about is none other than Jesus Christ. And so as we read this text today, I want you to keep that in mind because it is important to how we interpret and understand what is said. Beginning in verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging or stripes, we are healed. May God honor and bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. As we begin reading this morning in verse 3, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was not one who was esteemed by his hometown. In fact, the Bible says Jesus was rejected in his own hometown. Jesus could, Jesus could have been born in Grenada, but if he had been born in Grenada, according to God's word, do you know that people in Grenada would have said, Jesus, we wish you had never been born here. We don't want you. You're not one of us. You don't fit in. Jesus' own family questioned his loyalty to them. Come on, Jesus, why don't you spend time with us? Why are you always out feeding the poor? Why are you always out healing? Why are you out telling people about God? We have ministry that needs doing right here, Jesus. What's wrong with you? The religious leaders to whom Jesus was supposed to look up to, they questioned him. They questioned his motives. And ultimately, they killed him. But well, what's interesting about Christ's life is that the Bible says when he was on trial for his very life that Pilate, 
the Roman who is in charge of the proceedings against him, said, I find no fault in him. I want you to think for a moment about the American flag. It does stand for freedom. I think that's a word that we've misplaced, a word that we most likely misunderstand. I hear people on television all the time say, well, you know what, as an American, I just have certain inherent freedoms that are given to me. I want you to know something today, friend. Do you know what God has given to us as a freedom? He has given to us the freedom from sin. And it took Jesus Christ's life in order that we could have that. God has given to us the free choice to choose Christ or to choose the world. But I want you to understand as an American today, the only reason that you and I have any kind of freedoms whatsoever is because the sacrifice that God has made through the lives of men and women who have selflessly given of themselves so that you and I may worship in this place today without fear of persecution, that we may vote, that we may live in a home, that we may work a job. We are to be thankful. But you know, there are many people in the world who don't like America. Why? Because they don't understand where we are. How can you who say you have so many freedoms take advantage of them? How can you say you're a Christian nation and you're the most immoral nation the world has ever known? How can we say these kind of things? The outside world doesn't seem to like our type of freedom. But when you get down to it in our culture, there are many Americans that even though we live in the most prosperous nation in the history of the world, there are people in America who are lonely. There are people in America who are broken. There are people in America who are paupers. There are people in America who are searching for hope and answer and meaning to life. And they want to know, is there something else out there? <coughs> Look at what Isaiah says about Jesus. Jesus. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus was rejected, persecuted. The constant questioning upon his life did take its toll. But on one occasion when Jesus was ministering, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9 that he was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of ease and every kind of sickness. But seeing the people, he felt compassion. Compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. I want you to know, wherever you are today, God loves you. I've often heard it said, the most discouraging word in the English language is loneliness. Wherever you are today, you don't have to be lonely. Because, friend, Jesus is there. He was rejected by all of his friends, by all of those who said, oh, Jesus, we'll follow you. But when it came down to it, they wouldn't. You see, Jesus was there at creation. He was there creating us alongside the Father and alongside the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew what would happen to this creation he knew that we would fall. But Jesus also knew the role that he was going to play. So he prays in John 17, 3, which is often referred to as the high priestly prayer. Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one and only true God. 
and your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus wouldn't have been a contestant on Dancing with the Stars. You would not have seen him on The Voice. But instead, Christ existed in humility and he bore the penalty of my sin upon his life. What's so sad is that in our world of freedom, you and I sometimes struggle to recognize the pain and difficulty in others' lives. Case in point, on March the 13th of 1964, one of the most disturbing murders in the history of our nation took place in Queens, New York. A young lady by the name of Kitty Genovese was walking home from work and about 2.30 a.m. And a man followed her into an alleyway where she lived. He walked up behind and stabbed her. You say, why did he stab her? Because he was looking for an easy target. And in his words, women were easy prey. They didn't put up much of a fight. But the thing that struck the country was that over 20 people witnessed this girl being murdered. And no one did anything about it. I want you to think for a moment about people in your life that you know are hurting. That you know are just going through difficult and strenuous times. And you may say, well, Brother Brian, I've prayed for them. Man, that's great. Have you prayed with them? You may be out eating sometime and just feel led to buy someone's meal. You may be in line at Walmart and see someone struggling to pay for their groceries and say, you know what, I want to take care of that. You may see someone who looks like they're having a bad day. And God may very well lead you just to go over that person and say, man, I want you to know something. That sure is a nice dress you have on. Now, guys, you don't need to do that. This is for ladies, okay? But, you know, go over there and give someone a compliment. Build them up. Encourage them. He goes on in verse 4. And Isaiah says that he himself bore our griefs. Now, when it came to sin, Jesus didn't give humanity a self-help book or a checklist on how to take care of the issue of sin. But instead, Jesus went to the Father. He said, Father, give them to me. I'll take the penalty that's theirs. Listen, I love to go out and eat. Mainly at fast food places because they're not as expensive. <laughs> but I like to eat. I can't, I can't, I, I won't deny that. But do you know what's been a blessing to me sometimes when I go out and eat? And occasionally the places where I leave a tip. And the waitress comes up to me and says, Dr. Brian, someone's already taken care of your meal. Do you know what that is? It's a great illustration of someone paying my debt that I owe. I want you to understand something. When it came to the cross, Jesus Christ paid the debt that every one of us owe. He paid the debt. The Bible says when it comes to encouraging and lifting up one another, that we are to bear one another's burdens. What does that mean? Let me explain it in this way. It simply means that we're to put our shoulders under the AIDS patient, not run away from them, but put our shoulder up under the AIDS patient and love them with the love of Christ. We are to love the single parents, the cancer patient, the pregnant teenager, those who are discouraged, the discouraged students. People who are experiencing troubled marriages, grieving spouses. We are to build one another up by getting up underneath someone else who can't stand up on their own power. 
Because understand, without the power of Jesus who is resurrected, you and I have no power to stand. We are helpless. But man, that's why there's good news. And the good news is that God is a living and active God. And He's all about His children. He loves them. Isaiah writes that he was smitten and afflicted. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin, that means the effects of sin, is death. The author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 9.22, That the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed by the shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God did not kill Jesus. Did you hear me? God did not kill Jesus. Our sin and God's love for his people drove Jesus Christ to the cross of Calvary. And there he experienced the condemnation of sin for death. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 verses 45 and 36 that for three hours Jesus fought with hell and Satan and all the demonic forces. And then he cried out, it is finished. And his job was over. But guess what? The Bible tells us that death couldn't conquer him and the grave could not hold him. And Jesus was resurrected. And friend, he's alive today. Verse 5, every nail, curse, obscenity, every rock, every piece of spit, every stripe from his beatings was endured for me. And that's why Paul writes in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. Remember when I first began praying this morning? I said, we can find peace today. Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. The end of verse 5 states, and by his scourging or by his stripes we are healed. In 1 Peter 2 24, Peter also recounts this same statement. There have been people who have taken this verse and they said, That's right. Jesus died so that everyone could be healed of all their physical infirmities. Friends, I want you to understand this. Jesus Christ is powerful enough, if it be his will, to heal us from anything in this world. But I also want you to understand this. That is not the primary reason why he went to the cross. He went to the cross because my primary problem wasn't cancer. My primary problem was not simply uh, Sickness. My primary problem was death caused by sin. And the only way for that to ever be expunged, for the only way for that to ever be cured, is by his perfect blood, without his perfect life, ending, giving it to God as a recompense for my life. And that's why the Bible says, God so loved the world. Guess what it says? He loved the world. He loved you. God loves me. Man, isn't that cool? In a world, in a political landscape where we have tweets about this or we have emails about this and we have stories over here, let me tell you something. There's no fake news when it comes to word of God. This is truth. And God has said, Jesus says, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Do you have abundant life through Christ today? Because you see, after Jesus, no one else had to be beaten for my sin. He paid the price. He took my place. Let me close and ask, 
How often do we attempt to wear the stripes that Christ bore? I'm not saying this is wrong. But as Christians or as people who claim to be Christians, so often we wear Christian insignias or Christian statements on t-shirts, on armbands. We'll wear a cross around our neck. We'll decorate our home with Christian decor. But I want to give you a statement today and I want you to listen very carefully because I've not criticized any of those things. But listen, what you outwardly wear does not make you who you are. What you wear outwardly does not make you who you are. Who you are determines your stripes. I want to ask you. Do you have a relationship with Christ? If you do, then I have several questions for you. Number one, how's your prayer life? Would you consider it strong, average, or maybe it doesn't exist? How's your prayer life? I want to ask you a question that many ministers don't often ask. But I'm going to ask you. How is your morality? How is your morality? There have been people who said, oh yeah, man, I'm a Christian preacher. I've had people tell me they're Christians. Do you know I've had to preach the funerals of many people whose families said, oh, preacher, they were Christians. And I've been to people's services where they said, oh, they were Christians. But these people never darkened the door of the church. Not one person could ever be found who ever heard anything from Jesus from their lips. But they're Christians. How's your morality? For God knows our hearts. And he knows if we're real. Or if we're playing games, you can fool me, you can fool people in here, you can fool your family, you can fool your spouse, you can fool your parents, but you will never fool God. He knows where your heart is. He says in Revelation, the church in Laodicea, either get hot or get cold, to use some country lingo. Don't stay in the middle. I want to ask you this third. Where's God's word in your life? Is it primary? Is it secondary? Is it absent? It's not simply important that we read God's word alone. But when we read God's word, we've got to apply it in our lives. The Bible says that the word of God is living and active. I promise you, if you spend a lot of time in God's word, it could begin to tear into who we are. But God is in the process of making us more like Christ. And it's a good change that's taking place. Fourth, how's your attitude? How's your attitude? Are you defeated? Are you victorious? How's your attitude? And I'd also ask fifth, how is your stewardship? Stewardship simply refers to how you use the things that God has given to you. Do you use them for you? Or do you use them for God? How is your stewardship? Friendship, you've heard me say this many times, but I find it appropriate to say it here. The closer and more faithful you want to be to Jesus Christ, the more that Satan will come after you and the world will persecute you. I have to be truthful. But you know what James, Jesus' half-brother, writes? He says in James 1, 2, Consider it joy, my brothers, when you go through trials of all kinds. Because our trial produces endurance, which leads to perseverance.
Now, we didn't read this verse, but I think it appropriate here. Look at verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew 9 that he sees us as sheep. Isaiah writes, all of us have gone astray, each one of us to our own way. That means Brian thinks it's okay to go over here. And Joe says, well, I don't like where Brian's going. I'm going over here. And Sue says, well, I don't like where either one of you guys are going. I'm going this way. Each one of us has gone to our own way. And that's why God laid upon Jesus all of our sin. Billy Graham said this. As he hung, bled, and died on the cross, it was God saying to his people, I love you. Jesus has bore, he has borne our stripes so that whoever places their faith in Jesus may be saved. Would you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that it is always truthful. It always speaks to our hearts. It is our prayer, God, that now you would move. You would move us. And Father, perhaps you may move us to move the world. May we be faithful and say yes to you. In Christ's name, amen.